Welcome to 365 Brothers, the podcast. Have you wondered who are the Black men that you pass on the street every day? What are their lives like? Well, in this podcast, we have an in-depth conversation with Black men from all across America and all walks of life. Listen to their stories, their experiences, their wisdom. I'm your host, Robin Shine. Get comfy. Today, we're speaking with a Jacksonville, Florida native. He has 13 years of service, a former Marine, and he's currently the logistics manager for Bacardi Rum. We will be speaking with Julius Grant. Welcome, Julius. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So, Julius, I've just given a very basic introduction to who you are. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about you? Born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Served 13 years total service in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I left Jacksonville three times, returned home. Uh, this is the place that I decided to stay at home. I married uh, 23 years, married 24 years together. I have three adult children, uh, two boys, one girl. Uh, my, oh, my daughter is 19 and she is in college now, her second year. Uh, and I have a grandson that's now five years old, who is the love of my life because I am a superhero all over again. <laughs> I love that. That's yeah. awesome. All so, right. I love motorcycles. I, I ride motorcycles. I've driven my motorcycle across the United States. My furthest trip is Galveston, Texas, mm. up to Washington, D.C., and all the way down to Miami. So I have a Honda Goldwing. Nice. Yes. Nice. And, and does your wife ride with you, or does she ride on her own? She rides with me. So we're, okay. we're, we're a couple. So we, we hang out together on the motorcycle. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So uh, let's drop on into these questions. Okay. Julius, what is your favorite song and why? So my songs change from year to year. Um, so my favorite song this year is I'm Blessed by Charlie Wilson. And I picked that song because I heard his story from, you know, superstar to on the streets to rehab to reclaiming his life again and rededicating his life again. Oh. And, and putting out some very meaningful music. So I say that I'm blessed because of the, how I grew up, what I've been through, um, I'm blessed. No matter the good times or the bad times, I consider myself blessed because I grew up in you know, Jacksonville, Florida, like I said, um, and, and, and sort of like the projects, moving from the projects to an all white neighborhood to moving to a mixed neighborhood, growing up kind of in that way. So that's why I say I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be married 24 years. I'm blessed to have three healthy adult kids, one grandson. Uh, I'm blessed to have that communication, friends and family around me. So that's why I chose that song. I love that. And I, um, I can appreciate the depth of your gratitude for how it is for you. You yes. know, like it, it, what I hear is that you don't take any of it for granted. No, so, no, no, no. Yeah, I, can. I, I nothing for granted. You know, I've always looked for some type of positive out of everything that I do or that I go through. Uh, you know, and being a, you know, a, a, a black male, it, it's hard, you know, so you have to focus on, on your path. And you may not know what your path is, but you've got to focus. You've got to go somewhere. You've got to have some direction, you know, and you yeah. got to, if you fall off that path, you've got to try to motivate yourself to get back on the path. Yeah. You know, yeah. I always tell my, I tell my kids, don't let one bad decision define the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's one bad decision. You can get over that decision. You can get over that bad idea or that bad thing that you did. Just move on. You know, it, it's, it, it's going to hurt. You're not going to like it. You're going to be mad about it, but you have to go through it. You know, people always say, I'm going through a storm. I always say, when are you going to get through it? <laughs> 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 you know, I'm going through it. When are you going to get through it? You know? <laughs> yes. I was updating a uh, recording uh, for my first guest, Malachi Mott. He said, and I don't know if he heard it or if it was original to him, but he basically said, in life, expect the failures. You know, like almost like pull them forward because those are what you're building from. And that basically, 
it, it's not a lived life no. without them. And so I, I, I love what you're saying because that is the nature of this reality. You, if you are trying, you will experience something that doesn't work at least once. At least <laughs> and, once. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and you can always <laughs> and, step and the goal back is- and, and, and change it up. You know, there's, there's nothing set in stone. You know, there's nothing going to be planned 100% out. You're going to follow path A and that's going to be it. You know, you're going to go down that road and come back again, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, Julius, what's a favorite childhood memory and why? I come from a family of six and it's just being around my, my brothers and sisters uh, when I was growing up. Uh, it was six of us, so we was the biggest family on the block. So whenever we played outside, you know, when it was time to go in, the sports was over with, you know, everybody had to go in because we were majority of the team. Uh, Another favorite is helping out my stepdad. You know, I admire that man to this day. Uh, He was, you know, he served in the the Navy, uh, married my mom with uh, five kids um, and then had a six. Um, But he always had a, a quote or a saying, don't let your friends ruin your life. When you get a job, work the job. Don't try to make friends. That's a bonus. You know, he said, just do your job and go home. You know, people work so hard at not working and they always find an excuse. He said, you know, don't make excuses. Don't let anybody give you excuses. So my childhood member would be my brothers and sisters and, and then, you know, just hanging out with my stepdad. Was his being in the Navy, did that influence you joining the Marine Corps, do you think, or not really? Uh, not really. I was always told from ninth grade that you're going in the military because I didn't have the best grades in school. And my mom and dad was like, we're not paying for college for you. So here's an option, military or just find a job. <laughs> and it was honest, you know, I mean, I didn't have the best grades. So, but seeing him in the military and what he had to do, like serving our country and going away for nine months at a time and then returning home, you know, and, and still be that parent, you know? And so I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'll try the military. Before we actually started the recording, we were just kind of talking and we talked about, um, you know, the sacrifice of whether you're an officer or whatever, when you're in the military, you're not with your family for months at a time. And so you now mentioned that, you know, your stepdad was, you know, he had that same experience where he's, you know, being a father, but then he's away. What was that like for you as a child? Well, it, it made me and my brother kind of step up. So we knew in, in August he was going to be going on his ship for nine months. So we had to help my mom with the other kids and the cars and paying bills and helping her run the house. So we couldn't be out there doing our own little thing. You know, I was paying bills, you know, when I was in, in elementary school or, or in uh, junior high, you know, and then, you know, we all, you know, the three oldest had the three smaller kids. So we would take care of them so my mom could go work at the hospital. You know, just stepping up as a as a man, I can say that he actually, between him and my mom, taught me how to be a man of the house. You know, and, mm. and you know, when he came home, we were happy to see him. He was fun. I mean, because he wasn't there a lot, so he was always the nice guy. You know, <laughs> he was strict. Now, don't get me wrong, but he was that yeah. guy you wanted to hang out with. You know, him, him and his friends that come really over good. and want to change tires or change engines out of the cars. I'm right there handing a tool, not even knowing what I'm doing. You know, just handing tools, just kind of to be in that in that aura. In that aura. Wow, he sounds pretty awesome. He is. He is. <laughs> to, I mean, you know, to inspire that, as you mentioned at the beginning, that you know he married your mom. There were already five kids there, and it just sounds like I mean, his love was just, and his presence and his commitment was just a hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Well, that also explains how you introduced your family, because there was like, you could hear the pride and the commitment there. It's such a beautiful example of father to son and father to son, because I suspect your children will then, from that example that you've provided, will be able to do the same, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping I was a good example. I mean, I'm not perfect or anything like that, but what? Wait a second! My... Oh my gosh, you you're the first brother. I've been. You're the only one that's not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we we do the best we can. We do the best we can. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, let's talk about accomplishments. Okay. Um, I asked this question in two parts. First, I'm interested in an accomplishment that means the most to you personally. And then an accomplishment that, in your estimation, is the one where people are like, oh, or really? Either way. So let's start with the one that means the most to you personally. 
personally, it's being a family man, being here for my family. That's my greatest accomplishment, uh, personally. Uh, you know, being married for as long as I've been married and having three, you know, grown kids and now a grandson. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I'm, I'm all about family. Uh, I'm, I'm about, you know, being there for my, my sisters, you know, um, going, whatever they're going through. I, they'll tell you that I'm like the daddy now. You know, because um, my, my my dad passed away, so it's like uh, it's like, well, you know, you got to call Julius. You know, you got to have a plan. You just can't call him with anything. So, I, I guess it would say family is my my one of my greatest accomplishments. And then if I go pro professionally, I would say with graduating with my MBA, and I say that because of the grades that I got while I was in school. You would have never thought I was going to go to college. To actually go to college twice, and then go with my wife, we both achieved our same goal. You know, we got our, our bachelor's together and we got our master's together. And I always tell people I walked down the aisle three times with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I like so that. So it's just funny. So, you know, because a short story is that you know, she wanted to go back to school and, and, and get a degree to, to find out what she wanted to do. So we got her enrolled in everything. She said, you know, you know you're going to want to go because when I graduate, you're going to wish that you win. I'm like, okay, now, never mind, never mind. And I had been talking so much about I need to get a degree to, to get promoted at work. And they're not going to promote me if I don't have a degree or whatever. So we're going to the community college so she can take the interest exam. She goes, you know what? Since you're here, you might as well take the test just to see what you need. And it mm -hmm. just started from there. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you. So how long were you guys together before you embarked on going to college? I would say I think the five-year mark. We had, you know, okay. been together a little less than five years because our kids were in school and we were juggling back and forth. You know, she would go on Mondays and Wednesdays and I would go on Tuesdays and Thursdays so we could get the kids in the afternoon and all that kind of stuff. It was hectic. It was hectic. Wow. So you Five both, years into the marriage. So you both took on going to college while working and with children. Yes. At the same time. At the same time with different schedules because I was working nights and she was working days sometimes. Yes. All wow. at the same time. Um, <laughs> that's me clapping. <laughs> that's it's a great accomplishment. I, I love it, you know, and, 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 and we had, you know, we had, we had family there that helped us out with the kids and stuff like that, but I would be at work and I probably, you know, probably not the right thing to say, but doing homework while the lines and stuff was running and she would be at home doing homework and stuff, you know, after the kids go down or whatever like that. Yeah, well, we, we did it together twice. <laughs> wow. I, I, that, that's the first for me to hear that particular, you know, that particular way of both getting not just the bachelors, the bachelors and the masters together right. with kids. Yeah. And now are you at the, are you working, with, were you working with Bacardi the whole time? No. I've okay, had so, uh, five or six different companies that I had worked for. Okay. I started with a uh, label company and I was a night supervisor and I wanted to be promoted. And it was like, well, you know, you don't have a degree and all this kind of stuff. So I said, okay. And that's kind of how we started that. And then from there, I was, I was with that company for nine and a half years. And of course they went bankrupt, closed some plants down. I'm like, okay, recession hit. Now what are you going to do? Nobody's hiring somebody at that level off the street. So I had to take a supervisor's job again mm -hmm. while working. And I said, you know what? Or well, my wife said, you know, I'm going back to school. And then she had the recruiter call me and say, now, you know, when she finished, you're going to wish you'd done it again. <laughs> so uh -huh. that's how we did our MBA. Uh, she's a smart woman. <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> she's like, look, we're not going to even have this be an issue. Let's just nope. take care of this right now. I'm looking right ahead. Now. We're going to yeah. both have it. <laughs> Oh, you know how I men are. We'll say we're going to do something, but we need a little push, you know. So she was my little push because I always said, I ought to go to school. I ought to do this. I, I ought to, I ought to, I ought to. And she's like, why don't you just do it? And so we kind of did. Uh, <laughs> power of a good woman. It's no joke. <laughs> what I'm enamored by in the story is the two of you doing it together. Mm -hmm. But of course you would because family is first. Yes. And so, yeah. Family is first, yes. Mm -hmm. So. Let's talk about words. What is a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book? Work in silence. Let your success make the noise. Mm. And if you were at my, my warehouse, you would see that uh, painted on the walls. And one of the guys actually quoted that 
in an email that he sent to the whole plant. You know, he said, just like our warehouse manager says, our logistics manager say, you know, work in silence. You know, uh, work in silence, let your success make the noise. And we're doing some great things. So that's one of my favorite quotes. You know, a right. second favorite quote is, you know, I don't do anything that I don't love. So if I'm not loving something, I'm going to change it up. It's okay with me, you know, because life is just too short to be focusing and being miserable. So I don't do anything that I don't love. Yeah. So those are my two favorites. Well, um, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. I I wish, as a teacher, I I love what I do. You know, mm -hmm. even when the kids frustrate me. Yeah. You know, they'll. They are, they'll see me because I'll get that look like, okay, I'm done. You, you're, you're doing too much. And then they'll be like, oh, Dr. Sean, you, you okay? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, I'm fine. But I need y'all to get, you know, this doesn't work. Right. And, and so it's, it, and it was kind of, it's kind of fun when, when I first realized that, Oh my gosh, right. I'm not really upset. Like I, I like I actually have a whole demeanor that is designed to communicate the upset, but I'm still loving every moment of it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that's the way it is. You know, that's that's how I'm at work, you know. Things are going to happen, but it doesn't define the rest of the day. You know, I mean I like what's happening, but it's not mm -hmm. gonna change my character. You know, I'm still going to be out on the floor. I'm still going to be talking to people. You know, it's the same thing with my personal life. You know, things can happen, but I'm not that, I'm not going to let that define the rest of the day. I'm not going to be mad all day long. I'm not going to be sad all day long. You know, <laughs> it happened. It's a moment. I dealt with it. Now we're going to move on. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Um, so let's move into some experiences here. What is a person, moment, conversation, or event? that stands out as either changing the trajectory of your life or played a significant role in your life, had a significant impact? The significant impact is being told I wasn't going to do anything. So I had to prove to everybody that I would do something, you know? And, and, and I love my childhood. I wouldn't change a thing, but I was told, okay, you're not going to be able to do anything. You don't have the education. Who's, who was saying this? What was this? My, my siblings, my parents, you know, even though they were loving me, they, they, were, they were like, oh, you know, you got bad grades. You're not going to do it. You're not going to be able to do anything. So, you know, what are you going to, how are you going to fix that? You know, so that kind of made me go on the path of proving everybody wrong. You know, mm. so, so when I first went in the military, it was, you're not going to be, you're not going to graduate number one. Uh, or oh, I'll show you guys. So I graduated as an man, which is the highest thing out of boot camp. Okay, so now you go, you're going out of California. You're not going to be successful out there. Spend five years out there. Okay, I showed you guys. Come back home. Well, you, oh, you're getting out of the military now, so you're just going to be a bum on the corner street. Oh, I'll show you guys. I drove from California to Jacksonville, Florida in two and a half days, mm -hmm. nonstop. Got here on a Friday. On Saturday, I'm at the mall buying a shirt, tie, and a pair of pants and some shoes. Monday, I'm out looking for a job. You know, I just got out the military. I'm out looking for a job that Monday morning. By two weeks later, I had a job. You know, it's just people telling me what I can't do. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to show you what I can do. I got you. <laughs> you know, I like it. Have, were you always that account. way? Yeah, always that way. I'm always out to prove that I can do something that you said I can't do. You know, that's just me. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, wait. So when you were a kid and when when the teacher said you know you're not going to do well on this now when did that kick in that i'm going to prove you wrong because you didn't have it when you were in high school i'm guessing because what was it that had your grades not be you know up there in high school in your opinion in my it, i just it didn't interest me it was just book knowledge i knew i was going in the military from ninth grade so it's like, look, just give me my diploma and let me go in the military. And, and, and my goal was to get in the military and retire from the military. And that's it. That was it. Uh -huh. Nothing past that. But, you know, life throws things at you and you kind of change that. So, you know, I, was, I wasn't a bad kid in school. I'm the kid that sat in the back and just didn't care about schoolwork. Believe yeah. it or not. I just sat back. There. I didn't give any problems. I wasn't a smart mouth. I sat there quietly. I just didn't do the work. It wasn't that I couldn't do it. I just didn't do it. My mom would always tell me I got more common sense than I had book knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Well, you know, and this is something that is um, 
it sits with me a lot because I, I teach at a continuation high school. Mm -hmm. And so we get students who are not moved by book knowledge or it's not even that they're not moved by book knowledge. They might actually like book knowledge, just not the books that we're using as textbooks, right. Right. <laughs> you and know, and work. the way that school is structured, it just doesn't work for them. They're, it doesn't interest them the way it's designed for them. It doesn't work but it has nothing to do with their ability to succeed or they, they have some talent, some skill, they, each and every one does, but school isn't the place where that is nurtured for them, you know? Right. But for me, I love school, but, <laughs> I also, I, but I also get that that was something that is true for what, maybe 25% of students, like just love it and eat it up. And oh my God, more, more, more. Yeah. more but then more, the other yeah. 75% are like, okay, what I gotta do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, give, give me the minimum so I can get out of here so I can go do what I really want to do. Let me exactly. go find my path. And, and that was that was kind of me. You know, I, I like I said, you know, from ninth grade till I graduated, I was told, pick a service. I don't care what service, just pick a service because I'm not paying, we're not paying for college. You don't have the grades for that. And you know this, and that, you know, that's being honest. I'm okay with that, you know, fine. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I got in the military, I'm like, Hey, I like this. It was okay. You know, the first war broke out. Whoa, this is serious. <laughs> just not there collecting a paycheck anymore. You know, things uh -huh. happen out in California. I decided, you know what, this isn't for me anymore. I got out, came home. Now, what are you going to do? What's your next move? What's your, what's your next path? You know, my path was to say, okay, I'm not going to be a failure. And that's my biggest thing. I don't like failing. Not that I've never failed, but I just, you know, right. you, you can't just love that, you know. And don't yeah, you're not going to just default to it and just be like, hey, okay. this hey, is where wait, I wait, wait. You know, <laughs> so I, I step back, I punt, I move to the next thing. So my thing was, you know, finding a job and being successful at that job. And then, you know, being on these jobs back then, you know, this is like, you know, early 90s. And, you know, people were just going to work and not having a goal, you know. So I was a forklift driver, you know, in a warehouse, you know, and I worked there, you know, you're talking to the, I call them the old cats, but the veteran employees there, you know, hey, how long have you been here? 25 years. Doing the same thing? Oh, yes, yeah, this, this is what it is. Making $8 an hour? Oh, I can't do this forever. No, you know, so that was my thing. So a position came up in the office, you know, and I'm talking that at the time it was, all black guys in the warehouse and a white guy was in charge. You know, so he said, hey, one of us need to go in the office instead of bringing somebody in new that don't know anything, telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. The old cats, I don't know, I ain't going in there. I mean, that's that corporate stuff. Yeah, no one will do that stuff. What? Okay, now giving you the respect, say, hey, go for it. If you're not gonna go for it, I'm gonna do it. Because I wanna sit in that office, my own desk and telephone and computer at the time and, mm -hmm. and bark out orders. You know, I want to yeah. be that guy, you know, so that's kind of how I kind of started from there. I love that. Um, I have to say, one of the things I, I can't help but do when I'm doing the interviews is I'm always looking for patterns like we do, right? right? And one of the things that I noticed is, or that I see is true for you, is that you, you, you just, you have a plan. Like having a plan is you. Because yeah. even when you're talking about high school, you weren't applying yourself to those courses, but it's because you were already clear about your plan. And then when you got out of the military and you left California and went back to Jacksonville, the first thing you did was you, you, were in, you were executing your plan the moment you got there. And, and, and you even mentioned how when um, family call you, you know, it's like, have a plan. And I, I love it. I'm a planner myself. I get it. <laughs> yeah. But I can really see it's like, it's second nature for you to be in the future and taking action toward a future that you have determined you want. Yeah, and, 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 it's, and it really is just about living life, you know. And I don't, I'm not trying to be the richest person in the world. I just want to enjoy the time that I have. And, well, and, and that's and, and that's the thing. It's like, because again, you're speaking to another planner. So for me, like one of the things I, I've shared in other episodes is I, I love walking half mm -hmm. marathons. So as soon as I did one, oh, this is fun. And I was like, I'm going to do 100. <laughs> <laughs> right and it's like it's it's over 10 years but it it gives me what i look forward to and as i like planning for it and it pulls a life i love 
because I know what it is I'm after. I'm right. not, you know, just defaulting and seeing if there's something interesting at every moment. I, I know what it is I'm going toward. Like I said, planner to planner, I was like, oh, I see you. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me ask you about a moment or event or an experience that either puts a spotlight on or kind of highlights being a black man in the United States. That's a hard one because um, I have a lot of experiences and I guess it would be when I first came back to Jacksonville, Florida, being out in California for five years and coming home and, and hanging out with my brothers and sisters. And we were, you know, we had 24 hour bowling and we went out bowling two o'clock in the morning. Hmm. And here in Jacksonville, you know, after you get out hanging out either at the club or wherever you're at, going by getting something to eat and then going to home and everybody hanging out there was one of the things. So we stopped by this restaurant to pick up some, uh, you know, sandwiches, hamburgers or whatever. And I pulled in. Now here it is, I'm a young black guy in my twenties, driving a Cadillac Eldorado, you know, two door, my mom's car. I pull into the uh, restaurant, the little fast food place. I see my sister in line. So I pull back out. The minute I pull back out, a police officer pulls behind me. And his first question was, Why'd you pull out like that? I go, because I changed my mind. No, I wouldn't. it's because you saw me. I actually, I didn't see you. I just changed my mind because my sister was already in line. Didn't care. He gave me a ticket for something. I forget what it was. But he gave me a ticket. And, and he was just, just talking. When I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm back in Jacksonville, Florida. And that was the experience. And my friend that was sitting next to me at the time was you, you're in Jacksonville. Do not get outraged. Do not say nothing crazy or whatever. And I wasn't anyway, but just to have somebody sit in the passenger seat and tell you, calm down, relax, don't do anything. That was scary. That was a scary moment, you know. And after serving in the military and everything is great or whatever, not experiencing that out there, to come home and experience it was it was shocking. Yeah. You know, an, another experience it would be, you know, as I start climbing the corporate ladder is being the only black guy. You know, and you can just feel it in the room. When you walk in the room and everybody's sitting around the table, oh, there's Julius. Okay, so we can't say this and we can't do that or we don't want to offend him or anything like that because you're the only one, you know. And then when you have more than one, other black guys come up you, man, I'm so glad to see you. Wow, good to see you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, I'm just a supervisor. I know, but, man, it is just good to see you. Wow, they hired somebody else. I'm not the only one anymore. Okay, now it's two of us, <laughs> you know, those yeah. experiences, you know, and then having to just always do two times better than the next guy. You know, I can't make a mistake. I can't get upset about something at work because if you are, then you're that angry black guy, you know, yeah. you know, so you have to not only talk and act a certain way, you got to, you know, be on that line so people don't take it the wrong way because once you get labeled and your career is shot, you know, you have to move on. So I always had to be that, take that high road, you know. You know, other men that I've interviewed have talked about, you know, not wanting to be perceived as the angry black man, you know, kind of toning down. It, it, it really had me appreciate how much black men are not allowed to be fully masculine, you know. <laughs> You know, especially if you're six feet tall, 200 something pounds, you know, and that's me. And then you standing, you know, you standing over most people, you know, and they're looking at you, like, okay, you know, okay, when is he going to really go off? When we're going to really see it, you know, and you have to, and, you, and then on the flip side of that, it's if you're the only black in management, then you, the other folks, the other black folks, look at him, you know, he's Uncle Tom, or look at him, look, look how he acted. You know, maybe I'm acting that way because that's how you act at work. You know, it's not you're on the street. This is this is, this is professional. You know, I'm not gonna go up and slap hands and 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 that, and all that stuff. I'm gonna act professional at work. This is my job. You know, so right. it, it it's it's wild out here. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for uh, sharing those examples. I think as people hear how often and how many different occupations across the nation, how much black men have to manage the fact that other people yeah. are feeling a threat, even though there's no threat there, yeah. but their feeling it is still something that you're left to manage, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. You, you manage your character out of it, you know, 
that, that <laughs> I've always told my sons, and I told my daughter the same thing, that first impression, you know, so if you, somebody come up and talk to you, you're, the first thing out of your mouth is ignorance. You're going to get that in return. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to say everything that's on your mind. You can think it, but don't say it, you know, because you never know how somebody's going to react. You never know what's going to set that person off. So be on the defense all the time. Step back, okay, watch your posture, watch your tone. You know, it's okay to say yes, sir, and no, sir. It really is okay. You know, my dad taught me that. You know, it's okay to say that. Dad. That's a sign of respect. It's not that you're giving up or anything, but it's a sign of respect. What you try to do is de-escalate the situation. Yeah, yeah. Teaching high school, I understand. It's because it crossed your mind, honestly, honestly. Yeah. It's not required that you speak it. <laughs> you know, this is not TV. You're not going to get a redo, you know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what you brought one up, but I'm still going to ask here. Have you had any interactions with law enforcement? You know, like you shared the one about pulling out of the drive through Is there another or is there a general experience? Whatever you want to say. Uh, just general experiences. I, I always, and, and, and I always, you know, every time the TV comes on and they're looking for, you know, a six feet tall, 250 pound bald black guy, you know, you're like, okay, you need to be a little bit careful, you know? And for me, it's always about, like I say, de-escalate the situation. My run-ins with the office, with any kind of law enforcement, I'm always respectful. I'm always calm because I know it can get out of hand. So I, I just, I just, I, I want to make it to the next step. You know, so that's how I look at, okay, what can go wrong here? My hands on the steering wheel, I'm looking straight ahead. You know, give me your license and registration. I've got to reach in my back pocket and get that. And I'm saying this, can I do this? Yes, you can, you know. I can tell you one bad experience I had, and I had my kids in the car, we were driving, I'm going across this bridge and this cop was, you know, you know, when cops get on the road and he's in the front, everybody slows down or whatever. Nobody wants to pass the cop or whatever. Well, if the speed limit is 40 and you're doing 35, I'm going to pass you, you know, uh -huh. as long as I don't go over the speed limit. So I'm going, you know, 40 over, over the bridge or whatever. He pulls me over. I've got this big SUV. He's got the tenant windows or whatever. The guy walks up to the car, got his hand on his gun already, and he's already got an attitude. And I've got my kids in the back of the car. You know, he he looks around the car, let those back windows down. I'm like, what's the problem? These are my kids back here. You know, so I'm let the windows down. Everybody be quiet. Don't say a word. You know, my daughter's back there all nervous. She doesn't know. She's young. She says, it's okay. Relax. Well, you passed me because you were going slow, sir. I'm trying to get across the bridge. Well, slow it down. Uh, okay, yes, sir. Not a problem. You know, so that was another kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But again, I live to see another day. It's how I look at it. Right. Thank you for sharing that experience. If the United States was a woman, whether she is mother, wife, friend, neighbor, stranger, if the United States was a woman, what would you say to her? That's a hard one. I mean, that, that is a real hard question. I, I would say love more, understand more. Um, you know, we, we're in a society where everybody has an opinion about everything and you think your opinion is the right one. You know, it's your opinion, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent is yours. I would just say love and understand more. I, I think that's what we're missing, you know. You know, it's okay to be different, but don't be rude different. You know, it's okay to have a, an honest debate, but now we can't even talk to each other. You know, communication is out there. You remind me of... Um... You know, I'm older, so I still do Facebook. <laughs> I'm not doing, I'm not on TikTok and, TikTok and Snapchat. I'm not um, on none of that either. Still Facebook. <laughs> but uh, I've, I have a few people that um, are of a different political opinion. And it d never got in the way of having a friendship, right? And it still is not in the way of our being uh, friendly. However, I, I've noticed that a lot of what has it get so toxic in the interactions is the memes, and it's like we're we're trying to communicate with as few words as possible, right. with a visual and a few words on it, or you know a shocking statistic, and then what ends up happening is we're we're slinging sound bites and memes, and not having a conversation, and then. It, and then we somehow identify with these little little snippets yes. of, of, of what life is. Right. 
And now we can't have a conversation with anybody because we are boxed in to this snippet. <laughs> this, 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 it already did a past. Somebody could done something in the past. Now they've changed their views, but we hold that against them. Mm. You know, and we re and it's on both sides. And then you mm -hmm. can't, you know, we, you know, we were in high school. I mean, one thing I did like about high school is when we had debates, you know, mm -hmm. you got all your facts together, but it was an honest debate. You're trying to win this debate. It didn't get violent. Nobody's yelling and screaming. You had the little cliches, but that was about it. Now it's, oh, I got to punch you. I got to, you know, I got to call you names and all this other kind of stuff. So I just, you know, and, and I have friends that's on Facebook that, you know, different political, whatever. And they're still my friends. But I always tell people, now you know. I'd rather know than not know. Yeah. You know, I, I just rather know, you know. You know, when we moved in the neighborhood that we're in now, I had, we had uh, a neighbor across the street had the rebel flag across the street, you know. Oh, I can't believe, you know, can't believe we got that. I say, now you know. Now oh. you know. You know what you're dealing with. You know. You know, so it's a, it's a wave and keep it moving. You know, there's, right. it's gonna, there's not going to be, hey, let me come over to your house. You come over to my house. Mm -hmm. I know what you represent. I'm okay with it. That's your belief. Wave at you and keep it moving. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Julius, what is love to you? To me, love is uh, caring for something or somebody. You know, it's it's feeling that you know, I, I want to see you do well. I want you to always be right. I love riding my bike. I love taking walks. I love being around my family. I love being around my grandson. I, it's just so funny because I'm his hero now, and I love it. You know, and you know when he was born. Okay, I'm not gonna be doing all this, whatever, whatever. The kid was born, came over to the house. It was all, it was like, oh my gosh, instant love. And there's nothing like that until you have a grandchild. And it's now, okay, how can I make this kid just happy? And it's like, well, Papa, can we do this? Yes. Papa, <laughs> can I have 15 popsicles? Yes. You know, Papa, <laughs> can you dress up with me in Power Rangers? Yes. She's talking about a grown man, 53 years old, outside in a Power Rangers blue outfit. And my grandson <laughs> in a red Power Rangers outfit, full helmet, gloves, shoes, and everything. And you walk in the neighborhood. I don't care. That is unconditional love from my grandson. You know? I <laughs> love that. You know? And it's so funny because for my birthday, his mom gave me a picture of us in our Power Rangers outfit. I took that picture and put it in my office at work. And I am proud of that picture. Well... Um, if you want to share that with us, I'll be happy to make that the picture that goes with your episode. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> awesome. I'm serious. <laughs> That's I will great. send it to you. Okay. You're the first person that's getting the new, the new and improved question, because I used to ask, um, is there anything about you that we haven't covered that challenges the stereotype of being a black man? And, you know, by the time the interview is done, we've already addressed that. You know what I mean? Plus, mm -hmm. there's the whole idea of just bringing up the stereotype all over again, over and over and over again. And so I changed it to the one you have. And so now I can read it. Julius, what is something you've learned through your profession, training, experiences, or adventures that you believe more Black men should know? Being able to talk to people, no matter what color, race, religion. I think communication is the key because when people first see you, they don't know you. So if you can open up and, and, and talk to folks, I, I can tell you at work, people will tell you that I love people. I really love people. I like communicating with people on all levels and I have no problem giving you five or 10 minutes. I'm never too, never in a, in a hurry so much to where I can't stop and say, hey, how's it going? And not just giving you lip service. It's like, hey, how's it going? Well, I got this problem. If you need any help, I can get, point you in the right direction. Or if you want to come in my office and sit down and say, Jewish, can I just have five minutes to dip? Yeah, let's go for it. We, we, we lost that as a society. We lost that as, as people, being able to just listen to folks, you know, and actually care about people. If we had more people that cared about people, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now, you know, no matter what color you are or what religion you are. If you actually cared about the well-being of a human being, will be so much better. And, and that's kind of communication. I would tell anybody coming up behind me, anybody above me, hey, you know, if you actually sat down and, and got to know somebody and know their, what they're like, I think you'll like them.
communication for me is the big thing. You just what I love, obviously, uh, someone who interviews and works with kids, you, you just you never know what you're going to get when you start interacting with someone. When that conversation starts, you never know what you're going to discover, what you're going to learn. No. And um, and you never know on the other side what you might say that helps someone turn in a different direction or mm -hmm. gives them something that actually, you know, puts a fire under them to, to pursue something that's, that they're passionate. I mean, you just don't know yeah, you don't what know. will happen. You never yeah. know. And in my profession, you know, I, I, we have a lot of people. We have over 200 people at our plant. And I can tell you that somebody had been at the plant 30 years when I took over another department, came to me and said, you know what? I actually like coming to work again. It's like, what happened? It's just, just the way you are, your professionalism, your demeanor, just how you walk around and you actually care about people. The best compliment I got was that somebody that had been there for a long time said, I actually like coming to work again. And then one of my peers saying, you know, when you talk to Julius, he actually cares about people. He actually loves people. And she said that like five times in the form that we had. I'm like, okay, stop, stop. You know, it's all right. You know, <laughs> and people actually, I don't know why, they come to me and they go, hey, do you mind mentoring me? I don't know a whole lot. I just know what I did. You know, and it may not work for you, but I can try my best, you know, from other departments. They all come and say, hey, do you mind helping with, with this? Or, and what do you think about that? So, I mean, that's just one thing that I like. I love that. And, you know, I could let it go here, but I, <laughs> I sense that it's a little more than just that you listen and you care because it, it's one thing to have someone that you, you know, you, it's someone you want to come talk to. But when someone is coming to you and saying, I'd like you to mentor me. And it sounds like this is not just a one time off thing that, you know, people have asked you, what is it that, and I, and you're just, you know, unless you've actually asked them, you may not know exactly, right? But what do you think it is that they see in you that would make a difference in their career? Is it the communication or is there, is it something more? Because my sense is that it, it, it's, it's, some, it's, it's, it's a complex thing. I think it's it's me willing to help. Uh, I don't put myself above anybody. You know, we're all equal here. We're all here to do a job, and I, I'm in there helping. I'm actually trying to help you solve a problem versus running in my office, sitting down, and just say, getting it done. I'm listening to what, what, what's causing you to have this roadblock. You know, we, where are you trying to go with your career? You know, we, we see you, and we heard your story. So, you know, how did you get where you was at? Hard work. You know, those long hours and, and studying and all the other things and taking, sometimes taking stuff from the higher ups. You know, I said, you know, when you're in middle management, I said, it's like the, it's like the, uh, the justice of the piece is that scale. I've got middle management, on, I mean, I got higher management on one side and I've got the hourly folks on the other side. I'm trying to balance that out to get the work done. So what is that? I got to be able to communicate from the hourly folks of what they need and what they're trying to do. I've got to do the same thing for senior management. I got to communicate what they want and put it in better terms than what they kind of put out there. Just get it done. No, it's not just get it done. This is how we're going to get it done, you know, and kind of merge the two together so it's successful, you know. So, and, and you know, and I carry, I, I carry myself, you know, as always happy, always, you know, speaking to everybody, you know, I have no problem walking around the plant doing something. If I see something on the floor, I'm not going to go grab somebody to go pick it up. I'm going to do it. You know, I'm not going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do, you know, through this whole pandemic and everything, you know, people are working from home and all that. And that's fine and dandy. And I'm in a warehouse and I'm asking these guys to come in and work. I'm right there with them. I'm not sitting at home behind a computer going, hey, do this. I'm at the house being safe. I'm right there with you every day. And it's a leadership thing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad I asked because what you just described is a mouthful. I mean, it, you you could take any of the individual things you said, make them a chapter and here's a book on how to succeed at work, you know? <laughs> but I, I, I can see why they would come to you because it's, you really do get the power of communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, if anything, did you get from participating in this conversation? Um, being able to share my story. You don't really brag about yourself a whole lot. Do you think about all you've done? You're like, man, I probably should tell somebody that. I'm Tell somebody this. Year. So I just get the story out, and then there are some successful 
black men out there. We're not all crazy and all this stuff. And I'm hoping that something that I said, a, a story that I said, inspires somebody to do something else or, or tell somebody else's story. I'm hoping that gets out of it. I hope it gets, it reaches some people. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, um, there's just a lot of wisdom in the stories and the experiences of black men. And, you know, my wish is that that wisdom be valued as such as wisdom. So thank you for contributing to this body of wisdom that is the 365 brothers. Um, and I want to finish the interview by just saying thank you. I'm thanking you not just for the sacrifice and the commitment and being in the service, but really thank you for being the example of living a true life, living a life that lights you up and not having to pretend it's something else. Because sometimes people don't just wear that they actually love their life out in public, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that you do is an inspiration to the people around you. And it's evident from the compliments that they give you. And it's evident from the fact that they ask you to mentor them. And so you are the example of living a life you love. And thank you for that, because that means there are going to be a few more people who do that. And pretty soon, we just might have a world full of people who love their life. And then perhaps we could even love one another. Hopefully. So, and I'm, I'm yeah. happy to participate. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening. As you can hear, you do not want to miss any of these brothers. Make sure you subscribe. You can find more at our website, 365brothers.com, 365brothers.com. This is Robin Shine. To listen is to love.